Welcome to uh, another Patreon video, which we are going through the Gospel of Mark. I missed last week's video. I was busy uh, getting some classwork done and a few other things. Uh, but right now in this video, we I'm going to take you through uh, the rest of the early ministry of Jesus as laid out in Mark. Now, if you look at the PDF file that I sent out, uh, Mark 1, 1, 1 through 15 is like the prologue. It goes, It gives a brief account of Jesus' baptism and his temptation in the desert and then his uh, going back to Galilee, proclaiming that the kingdom of God is near. The rest of chapter 1 are a series of, um, I think, five segments, five episodes that kind of detail some of his early ministry and how initially he was gaining a following and there was a lot of positive feedback. When we get to the sixth episode, though, at the beginning of chapter 2, this is where things start to change. And this is involves the episode of Jesus healing the paralytic. Now, most of us know this story in general. He's in the house with his disciples. It's a crowd outside. There's four, there's guys with their friend who's a paralytic on a mat. They can't get through the crowd, so they go up on the roof and they dig a hole in the roof and they drop them down. And when Jesus sees the paralytic on the mat, the mat, the first thing he says is, your sins are forgiven. And then we're told that the scribes there object to him saying that because only God can forgive sins. And that's true. And so what you see here is, by saying that to the paralytic, Jesus is making an implicit claim about his own identity that the Jews who were hoping for a Messiah were not expecting. Uh, most Jews were hoping for a Messiah, just a Davidic king whom God would send to free them from foreign oppression. And Jesus is here, and he's basically saying, I'm a little more than that. And this is what gets us into the, the heart of what's, what's going to become the controversy. Um, the way he responds, though, is very funny, I think. When they object to him saying, your sins are forgiven, what he does, though, is... And you could read it yourself, and I'm going to summarize it for you. Um, basically, he turns to them and says, Oh, really? It's hard to say? What's easier to say? Your sins are forgiven, or he turns to the guy, Be healed, pick up your mat, and go home. And he says that, and that's exactly what happens. And so what Jesus is doing there is he's showing, and this is the key, that his claim to be, being on par with God, being able to have the authority of God to forgive sins, that is proven by his ability to physically heal people. If you want to think of it, his physical healing of the guy is proof of his spiritual authority. That's what's going on in the paralytic scene. Now, um, the, the interesting thing is uh, that, like I said, kicks off the initial growing controversy. Um, and so we move on then to the next episode of the calling of Levi, the, cat, the tax collector. Another episode that you might be familiar with, but it's really controversial, especially if you're a Jew hoping for a Jewish Messiah king to free yourselves from uh, Roman oppression. Here Jesus comes he claims to have the authority of God to forgive sins, and then he turns around in chapter 2, 13, 17, by the sea again, because every time he calls disciples, he's by the sea. He calls Levi, which is also Matthew, is the name in the Gospel of Matthew, to, he calls Levi to be one of his followers, his disciples. Now again, most people know Levi was a tax collector for Rome. Um, Therefore, the Jews would see him as a traitor to his own people. It would be kind of like, I don't know, let's say ISIS took over America, and I was living in your neighborhood, and I became a, a tax collector for ISIS. You hate ISIS, but you would really hate me because I was a traitor to your people. And so the fact that Jesus asks a guy like that to be a follower of his would probably have made a lot of Jews' heads spin. This guy works for Rome. How can he be a follower of the Jewish Messiah? And so what you see here um, is a growing controversy. Now, two other things need to be noted. Uh, when we are told that Jesus um, 
reclines at the table at Levi's house. Don't see that as a, like, hey, grabbed a burger with him at McDonald's, like, hey, he's my buddy. In the Jewish tradition, if you go to somebody's house and share table with them and have a meal with them, that was a really big, significant gesture. You are showing that you accept that person, okay? It's not just a casual thing. It's a real um, declaration that you accept the person. And therefore, the Messiah shouldn't accept tax collectors. Yet this is what Jesus is doing. Now, um, another thing to note is the fact when he does that, we are told that the scribes and Pharisees, and at this point in Mark, this is the first time we mentioned about the Pharisees, is they object to him eating with tax collectors, not just with tax, tax collectors, but with tax collectors and sinners. Now that always struck me as strange, because I was always taught, well, we're all sinners. Why are the Pharisees upset that he's eating with sinners? They're sinners too. Um, but that's the wrong understanding of sinners that they would have had. From the Pharisees' perspective, because they were so zealous in keeping the Torah that they came up with their own set of oral tradition rules to ensure that you don't break the Torah, um, they viewed their fellow Jews who didn't, who weren't as obsessed over the Torah as they were, they viewed their fellow Jews as sinners. Okay, so it's a very hypocritical, condescending view. Um, therefore, they objected that this supposed Jewish Messiah was hanging out with tax collectors of Rome and the bad kind of Jews who aren't as, you know, religious as they are. And this, again, draws into further focus the growing conflict between Jesus and the religious authorities. Um, so, anyway, so that's the first two episodes we've covered in chapter two, is controversies growing. In the next episode, the eighth episode of this whole larger scene of his early ministry, um, we have another point of tension. We're told that the Pharisees and some of the disciples of John the Baptist come and ask Jesus why he and his disciples don't fast. Um, now, um, Jesus responds with a, basically a two-part answer. First, he talks about this thing. The bridegroom's attendants don't fast when the bridegroom is there, uh, but when the bridegroom is taken away from them, then that's when they're going to fast. And if you're reading that, like, what is he talking about bridegrooms and weddings for? Well, it is gets back to a major th a fundamental theme that goes throughout the whole Old Testament and New Testament. Um, it goes back to the significance of the meal. Um, they looked forward to when the Messiah would come and establish the kingdom of God. They viewed that as kind of like that's when the great messianic banquet in the kingdom of God would happen and we would all join with him together. And so therefore, what Jesus is saying is by talking about himself as the bridegroom, he's again making the claim that he's the guy, he's the coming Messiah, coming son of man, and he's with them now. And so therefore, because he's with them now, it's the time to celebrate. In a sense, his eating with tax collectors and sinners is a celebration of that messianic banquet meal ahead of time, so to speak. And therefore, he says, because I'm here already, it's not the time to fast. Now, the reason why the, some Jews, like the Pharisees, would fast is because the fasting was a way of kind of ceremonially uh, showing your repentance and sorrow for your nation's sin in hopes that God would one day come to you and pour out his spirit again and you would be his people again. And so Jesus' answer is the reason they're not fasting is because we're celebrating that I've actually come. But then he hints that there will be a time when he's not there. That's when his followers will fast. So there's kind of a tension there. The second part of his response is, um, and you, you probably heard this before, him talking about you don't put new wine into old wineskins and you don't sew a new piece of cloth onto an old garment. Because if you do, the wineskins will burst, the, the, the garment will tear, and it'll be worse than before. What is that point there? He's kind of basically saying to the Pharisees that their rules and regulations of the Torah, now that the Messiah has come, that old stuff that was, only, that was there as a means of looking forward to the Messiah, now that the Messiah has come, there's no need for that anymore. And so therefore, he's not, his movement starts a new phase in God's plan for the world. And therefore, the, the, the Torah regulations and laws are 
unnecessary and irrelevant with the coming of, with his own coming. And that's when you get to the letters of Paul, that's exactly what Paul says as well. But again, that would be a point of tension for the Pharisees. They wouldn't like to hear that. The next issue, the next episode, um, we see the conflict continuing. It's in chapters 2, 23 to 28. Now they're questioned about working on the Sabbath. And all they were doing is they were walking through the grain fields and some of the disciples took some of the grain and ate it. Um, but the Pharisees, because they were so obsessed with keeping the Torah, they had come up with extra laws in their oral tradition that defined what work means on the Sabbath. And in their definitions of work on the Sabbath, they had determined that his disciples were breaking the Sabbath. Now note, there's nothing in the Torah that says you can't pick heads of grain off of stalks. It's not in the Torah. It's in the Pharisees' oral tradition. And that's what they were criticizing Jesus and his disciples for. Jesus' response, he comes back with bringing up the example of David, King David, King David, he's the son of man, son of David. Um, when David was fleeing from Saul, he goes to the priests and he eats the bread of the presence, which technically only the priests are allowed to eat. Um, but, but Jesus' point is when David ate the bread of the presence, no one accused him of breaking the Torah. It's a good thing because he was hungry. Um, and so therefore, his whole point is, the per and then he, his whole ultimate point concerning the Sabbath is, the whole point of the Sabbath is to just relax, take a break. And this is what he means by, you know, the Sabbath was created for man, not man for the Sabbath. What the Pharisees had done by making extra rules in their oral tradition that defined work, they were making resting on the Sabbath into something you had to work at. And it was kind of self-defeating. And so what um, he says, therefore, is that you're making up your own rules. The Sabbath is just to chill out. And if they're chilling out and they happen to, happen to take up some grain heads off of stocks, that's fine. And then he says, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath, which he's basically saying, by the way, I have the authority of God. I can say what I want and I could, I could make this change if I wanted to. So again, another point of tension where he conflicts with the Pharisees. So we've had the, the paralytic, the calling of Levi and eating with sinners, the question of fasting, and now this. All of a sudden, after the initial ministry where he's getting accepted, boom, 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 conflict, conflict, conflict is growing. And this brings us to the 10th episode. He's back in the synagogue. And the last time he was in the synagogue, he cast out the demon from the man. Here, though, after the growing conflicts, the situation is different. We're told that there's a man with a withered hand, and the Pharisees were waiting to see if he's going to heal him on the Sabbath, because, you know, if you heal him on the Sabbath, you're working, which, again, it, the whole thing is just bitterly ironic. They're so obsessed with legalistic rule-keeping, they are blind to the fact that if you heal a guy who, with a withered hand, this is a miracle of God himself. But because they are so blind to it, because, in a sense, they've made the Torah into their own idol, they become blind and deaf to what God is actually doing. And that is the point of what goes on in this episode. They want to see if he's going to heal on the Sabbath, because it would break their oral tradition. And Jesus responds by getting rather brazen. He brings the man out in the middle of everybody, and he challenges the Pharisees in front of everybody. Um, he says, is it okay to do good or evil on the Sabbath, according to the Torah? And obviously the answer is the Torah wants you to do good, even if it's on the Sabbath. <laughs> doing evil is always evil, no matter when you do it. And doing good is always good, no matter when you do it. Okay, that's his point. It's not an evil thing to save a life if it happens to fall on the Sabbath. Okay, and once he says that, he turns to the guy and he heals his withered hand. And at that point we are told a, couple, a really interesting thing about what the Pharisees' response is. When he does that, when he shows them up in the synagogue like that, we're told that the, the Pharisees go out and they team up with the Herodians to, in order to search for a way to kill and destroy Jesus. Now, the Herodians are basically, you know, Herod's people. 
the, and Herod was the king of you know Judea. Um, and so we need to know first of all that they're supporters of King Herod, and Mark is telling us fairly early here here in the ministry um, that Jesus is being targeted not only by the religious authorities like the Pharisees, but also now by the political authorities, the Herodians. You know, this is in the historical context, these were who his enemies were. Um, and it's kind of interesting also, and this is if you read it closely with an ear to literature, that we are told that the Pharisees and the Herodians were seeking to destroy Jesus. He had Jesus had just challenged the Pharisees in the synagogue. Um, about what was permitted to do on the Sabbath. And he can contrast it to saving a life with destroying a life. So the thing, they're trying to do something that is really bad. That's the point. All right. So after that, we move on uh, into the 11th episode of this early ministry. And Jesus is once again by the sea. And this kind of brings us back to that first episode when he called his first disciples by the sea. And not surprisingly, in chapter 3, 7 through 12, um, we are told that um, he is once again with his disciples. Um, now, when he says disciples at this point, it's not just the 12. It's Disciples just mean his followers. Um, and this scene is kind of an act, a summary statement of his healings and his casting out of demons, um, his silencing of demons so they don't tell who he is. And in particular, we're told that people come following him from everywhere. Galilee, Judea, which are Jewish places, but all Jerusalem, but then also Idumea and the other side of the Jordan, that would be the Decapolis, Tyre and Sidon. So basically, in that little verse there, we're told that Jesus has gained into the following not just from his fellow Jews, but he's getting other people, Gentiles, are being interested in him which again is kind of a foreshadowing of the eventual um, going to the um, uh, Gentiles. Finally, the, the 12th episode of this early scene, again, concludes with, this is in chapter 3, 13 to 19, once he's been by the sea and he gathers followers, he goes up a mountain and he chooses 12 apostles from among his larger following of disciples. All right? Now, when you think about that, what does that sound like? Coming out by the sea with followers, going up a mountain, and picking 12. If you thought Mount Sinai in the Exodus, you would be correct. And so what we need to see here in this final scene that concludes this early segment, this section, um, is uh, that he is acting like a new Moses. Mark is portraying the beginning of Jesus' ministry against the backdrop of the Exodus. He is bringing his people out from the sea, and he's going up a mountain. And what he's doing, therefore, is just like Moses brought the people, of the Hebrews, to Mount Sinai to make the people of God, the 12 tribes, Jesus is bringing his people to this mountain to reconstitute the people of God around him. Not the Torah, even though they're still all Jews, but the defining feature of the people of God surrounded, that surround Jesus is going to be Jesus himself. Um, and that is a very important thing. And when you look at the, the people he chooses to be his specific apostles, they come from everywhere. Uh, Judea, Galilee, some are fishermen, tax collectors, zealots, even a Canaanite. And therefore, this reconstituted people of God around Jesus is going to look different than ethnic Israel. And if you realize that's what it's trying to get at, you can see why the conflict is going to grow between Jesus and the Jewish religious authorities. All right, so that's um, that gets us up to the next major section that we'll cover next time. It starts from the Beelzebub controversy and goes all the way to the Transfiguration. And this is a really fun scene to do. It might take a couple of weeks to do it. But um, the, the key with reading anything in the Bible, the Gospels in particular, if you read slowly, and see how each episode builds off another and refers to one another, you'll start seeing more and more stuff to the narrative arc of Mark, um, of how he's trying to portray Jesus. All right, I hope that helps, and uh, I will make a next the next video next week. Bye.